Hello, I'm Masak. Uh, this is a talk about the kind of thing that I like to be doing with problems nowadays. And you'll see how it sort of uh, ties into not only uh, this kind of problem solving that I'm going to talk about, but also compilers and other things. Uh, it's in order to solve a sort of complicated problem, you either, uh, one, uh, know the solution already, in which case it's trivial, or two, you uh, choose a different, simpler problem and solve that instead. And this is a case of solving a sim different, simpler problem. So what we'll do here is uh, transform a tricky problem into a problem that's easier for the, compu computer, to, uh, the computer to solve, and uh, solve that instead, and then sort of transform back at the end. That's the idea with this uh, project I've been doing with Dancing Links. Now, Dancing Links is, a, is from a paper by Donald Knuth. He invented this technique for certain kind of search problems, uh, which are intractable generally, but with this technique you can actually start doing them. Okay. Right. So, how many recognize this uh, puzzle? <laughs> how many have actually solved the Sudoku puzzle? Quite a bunch of them. Uh, I'll be honest. I, I really, I don't really like Sudoku. I've never solved one sort of on paper. I think it, uh, it, it seems kind of pointless. Uh, but I can, I can see that other people might like it. The idea, anyway, is uh, you fill in the blanks by following certain rules. In this case, with Sudoku, the rules are uh, a number should never be duplicated on a row. A number should never be duplicated in a column, and the number should never be duplicated in one of these subcells. And you see it's a 9 by 9 grid, so we have exactly one number for every row, column, and subcell. And of course, these puzzles may be impossible as well if you sort of uh, start out with a, uh, uh, with a combination that's, that doesn't allow any solutions because there's a collision somewhere, so you, you can't really tie the knot. Because, uh, but of course, the, the problems in the newspapers and so on are usually not only do they have a solution, they usually have a unique solution as well. And they don't have to have a unique solution. That's easy to see, because you can just leave all the squares blank, and then you have all possible solutions and all solutions. But here's the solution to this one. And how do we end up with this? Well, people uh, like to write uh, specific solvers, uh, sort of using the same kind of heuristics and, and rules that people use when, when they solve this. So how do we find out there's a five there, for example? Well, we look at all the other rows and all the other columns and all the other subsets and draw conclusions and solve it. So it's kind of specific and it's easy to end up with a solver that doesn't really solve all sort of problems and, and so on. Uh, if you're Peter Norvig or someone else who has done AI and, and search and things like that, you know immediately when you see this kind of problem that it's a classical case of search and propagation, uh, which means that you, you do a tree search, but you also, uh, at every stage, use these kinds of uh, relations between things, so you don't try things that you can see at that point would be impossible. That's the propagation step. So you propagate the rules into actual possible sets of values in each cell. So that's sort of good. That's all it would tree search. Now for something seemingly completely unrelated. Uh, there's a problem called the set cover problem, uh, which says that we have one of these matrices with zeros and ones, and we have the sort of vague promise that there might be a collection of rows here. You might see a weak connection here with, with the Sudoku problem. There might be a collection of rows that we can choose so that we have exactly one, one bit in every column. 
So look at this one for a bit. Do you see such a solution? So what we're looking for is a single one in some column. Uh, for each row that we select. Now this problem is hard, it's actually empty complete. So I don't blame you if you don't see it immediately. But if you do, feel free to shout out. One, four, and five. Yes, and I noticed, sir, that you're one based, which is fine. <laughs> <laughs> one, four, and five. Uh, so, yeah, you, you could see that by inspection because this is quite a limited number of rows and, of course, as this matrix grows, it gets increasingly intractable to, to actually spot those. Uh, here's how a computer might solve it. A computer more or less cheats, by the way. Uh, it goes and, and focuses on a certain column and how we think this column is a, a subject of, for later. Uh, let's say that it just randomly cho chose this one. And it sees two ones in that column, namely this one and that one. So we mark those rows as candidates that we want to try out. And, well, <coughs> at some point we try out this one. So now we've, we mark this row as part of our eventual solution that we may end up with. And, of course, we may fail in this, uh, but it looks kind of hopeful that five uh, was part of the solution that was shouted out as well. So now we repeat this procedure. Uh, we sort of, we've locked these two columns already, so all the columns that are free to look at are these other ones with zeros, those are the ones that we want to fill in. So these are ineligible. And instead we choose this one, for example. And here you see we have two candidates, the one at the top and the one at the bottom. And we choose one of them, let's say number one, since we know that's part of the solution. And now three more columns are ineligible because we filled those with ones. And we get to choose between one of these columns, so we choose this one for example. It doesn't matter at this point actually. And then we have the choice between these rows for fulfilling uh, the problem and finding the solution, so we choose say this one. And here's our solution. Now all the columns are ineligible, and we ended up with one, four, and five. So, nothing strange about that, right? But you saw that there was a lot of magic, and uh, we somehow end up with this row or this column on the way. And actually what's hidden behind all of that is uh, an exponential number of tries and failures and backtracking. So, uh, because of all the backtracking, we end up with uh, two to the number of rows time steps. And this isn't that strange if you think about it. When might you end up with a, a problem that uh, takes this amount of time? Well, when you have a set of some kind, and we do here, we have a set of rows, and we want to find some subset of the set of all rows that fulfills a certain property. So we basically have to look at the empty set, then all the sets of a single row, and all the sets of uh, two rows, and so on, up until the set of all rows. And the only way we can do better than this to, to the um, is to uh, find ways to cut branches early on and, and sort of do this propagation step like, like we did in the Sorobi case. The problem also with doing uh, well, we have to do some recursion here and, and uh, try new solutions by basing them on old partial ones and so on. The problem with that is that it often takes a lot of time to copy things in memory. Or it also takes a lot of time to traverse an array of zeros and ones and finding the ones and so on. So there's a lot of wasted dead time on just uh, looking over what solution we have so far. Right, we're in the land of entry complete problems. So we use a technique called the uh, doubly linked list, lists to sort of quickly find all the ones. If we link together all the ones in the matrix, uh, we can just jump to the next one instead of searching for it sort of 
element by element, which is kind of nice. And here is the trick that Knuth used to uh, make this really interesting. Uh, because when we delete an element in a doubly length list, let's say we'll, we want to delete the middle one, what we end up with is something like this. So the node before suddenly points at the node after, it skips the one in the middle, and the node after points back to the node before. That's exactly what we expect. But we tend to uh, forget or, or not think about that the node in the middle actually retains all the information necessary to rebuild the doubly linked list as, as it was before we deleted the node. You see, it still retains these now unused links to, to the original structure of the linked list. So we can easily rebuild the structure as it was before. Now let's, let's turn this matrix into one of these linked list structures. So we're not changing anything here, really. We're not changing the content content of the matrix. We're just uh, creating a different model, a different structure for it. So we focus on all the ones here. I have squared them here. And then really those squares are along with the position information that they sort of encode in the matrix. They are really all we care about in this uh, solution. Each one uh, suggests a combination of a row and a column that we have chosen to combine. So we just drop the whole matrix. It's not needed anymore. We can just keep the coordinates if we want. And this is just as difficult to traverse, perhaps, as uh, the original matrix. We still have to sort of look what's the next one and find it in some structure. So we tie things together, first with a bunch of header elements at the top. These just keep track of which columns have we chosen so far. So, and you'll notice we have one root element up here, which is sort of the header element of the header elements as well. So this structure now contains of a bunch of nodes, which previously were ones, a bunch of column headers, which contain a bit of metadata and partial information, and a root. And we'll come back to the root. Now we link together everything with doubly linked lists. These are meant to represent double links. It took forever to draw this. <laughs> <laughs> and then we link together everything vertically as well. So there's nothing strange about this really. It's just uh, every node has four links in all possible directions. And if it's sort of at the edge, it links back to, to the one so it wraps. Now we have the possibility to traverse things from the root node and over all columns really easily. Uh, and things will get sort of toggled off and uh, taken out of the doubly linked lists when we're not interested in those columns. We have the possibility to iterate down a certain column. And uh, uh, we, we'll know when we, we're done because we come back to, up to this uh, column header element. And we have the possibility to iterate uh, across one specific row as well, which is important when we want to toggle the columns. And we can do this both ways, which is uh, actually necessary. If you think of the, of, about this doubly linked list trick, it actually works quite nice. And you can do it many times, sort of delete, 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 and then add back, add back, add back, add back. Uh, the important thing is that you do the adding back in exactly the reverse order as the deletion. Otherwise, things will get screwed up. And this is where the name dancing link, links come from. Excuse me, I have a cold, so I might sound a little nasal at times. Uh, this is where the name dancing links come from. Uh, when you do this, you see things jumping around and being disconnected and suddenly again being reconnected and so on. So the real gain here is we, we never copy any information. Once we have allocated this structure, which doesn't take in that much memory from the beginning, we, we can just play around with that and explore all the two to the n possible solutions using only this data structure, which is kind of convenient. Uh, so no more allocations after the initial allocation.
So this is what I mean by solving a simpler problem. Generally, we have a solver, a problem program that we wrote, and we send it some input, and the solver returns with some output. But in this case, with dancing links, we have this really boring 0-1 matrix, uh, even represented as doubly linked lists uh, in two dimensions. Dimensions is kind of boring and, and hard to actually see some context in. So for example, for the Sudoku problem, we want really to treat it with, as a Sudoku problem, not as a, a, an exact cover set problem, exact set cover problem. So what we add to this picture is uh, step before and the step after. So the reader is something that takes in, for example, a Sudoku problem, which we can specify in pure ASCII art as the Sudoku numbers that we have and the empty spaces with numbers that we don't have. And it gets translated by the reader. The, the thing that the, re the reader does is to translate this into a 0-1 matrix so that you don't have to. <coughs> the exact set cover problem is then solved by the solver and the writer uh, translates it back. Uh, what the writer gets then is the solver's set of rows. So it translates this back to, oh, this row meant that there was a five uh, in this particular location, for example, in this broken problem. Now, uh, to give you a sense of why exact cover comes into the picture and what it has to do with Sudoku, uh, I tend to think of this as a set of resources that we have to cover exactly. Uh, let's say you have a living room and you want to tile it with some uh, nice wooden tiles. You don't want things to overlap and you don't want gap, gaps anywhere. And sort of metaphorically, that's the situation we have in Sudoku as well, except that the resources in question aren't wooden tiles and the locations in question aren't different positions in your living room. Instead, we have something like the resources in question are rows, columns, and um, numbers, and sub-squares in the Sudoku grid. Those are the four things that you can use up, and you can use all of those exactly once. And the locations are, well, the different rows and so on. Another problem uh, is called pentominoes. I don't know if I have a picture of this. No, I don't. Uh, you all know those um, Tetris blocks, for example. If you do the same thing with five blocks, it's called pentominoes, and there are exactly 12 of these if we allow symmetric blocks. Uh, and we have, so we have 12 of these, and. Uh, which means that uh, they fit into something which is 60 blocks big. What's 60 blocks big? Well, a chess grid is 60 blocks big if you sort of remove the middle four ones. So that becomes the canonical problem for pentominoes. And there perhaps it's easier to see the, the connection between pentominoes and exact set coverage, because that's just like tiling your, uh, your living room, except that's a hole in the middle. Uh, so that's really what we want to do there. We're tiling our living room. Uh, and the locations correspond to locations on the, uh, on the actual board. Another problem which is sort of easy to, to see the connection with tiling is eight queens. But that, it, the, the tiles themselves are a bit wonky. They're not just the queens, but they're also all the uh, positions that that particular queen can attack. So it sort of becomes a star shape. Um, and also with a twist, because each queen can attack the same space. That's, uh, that's perfectly allowed, as long as they don't attack each other, but they can attack the same space, uh, which is fine. But with, just with a slight modification of the uh, dancing links algorithm, we can uh, cover this too. 
just have to make sure that some columns can be covered several times and those columns which correspond to the, the locations that the queens attack, we don't care that much about them. So I've written three implementations of, of this dancing links. They're online on GitHub uh, under my user account. Uh, the big surprise with the C implementation, well, first off, I'm, I'm not an experienced C programmer, so it was kind of uh, fun and frustrating at the same time to write the C implementation. Uh, I eventually made it, sort of it took three days before YAPSI, and suddenly I ended up with the C implementation. And by then I thought, oh, what a waste of time. Uh, three days for this, and all I'll get is like 50% uh, speed up or something. Uh, for the Pentominos problem, it takes the Perl 6 uh, dancing links solver 90 minutes to find all 100 and whatever solutions. For the C implementation, uh, anyone has a guess? Someone who wasn't at my EPSI talk? One minute? Nine seconds. Mm. So yeah, Perl 5 is kind of slow. Uh, 5 or 6? This was comparing Perl 5 against C. Okay. Well, 5 took 90 minutes, C took 9 seconds. The plus 6 implementation takes longer than both of them. <laughs> uh, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Here's a nice thing that I realized with the plus 6 implementation. So, uh, if you haven't tried translating something that you wrote in plus 5 into plus 6, I really recommend it. Uh, it might be slightly different for you because I'm, I see myself as a Perl 6 programmer who occasionally writes in Perl 5, for example, at work. Uh, so I, I tend to use Perl 6-ish idioms even in Perl 5, uh, but, which makes it very simple to, to translate. But, but it's kind of an eye-opener what you can do in Perl 6 suddenly becomes possible that isn't as easy in, in Perl 5. So, here I, I've chosen an especially uh, interesting subroutine, which is really a, a method in Perl 5, uh, to highlight what you can do first with the direct translation, and then if you sort of stop and think about it, and what you can do in Perl 6. Uh, <clears throat> what does this uh, method do? We'll start with that. Well, you, you, real, uh, you remember uh, the choice of column. Uh, we were free in doing that. It's sort of a non-deterministic choice. Uh, we can take columns in any order as long as we uh, choose all of them at some point. It turns out that for most of these problems, choosing the column with the least number of ones in that column is the optimal choice because then you go down uh, a path in this gigantic tree which uh, doesn't go so deep. It sort of has time to, to branch off things before it goes too deep. Uh, so that's sort of the default thing, and then you can plug in different column choices for other problems. Uh, but what we do here, it's, it's really a classical um, algorithm. So we keep track of, of the column that we found, found so far with the least uh, amount of ones. I have uh, uh, an accumulator with the actual least amount of ones. Uh, infinity is a constant that I declare somewhere uh, at the top of the program is something like 2 to the power of 32, something ridiculous which we never attain. And then, because it's a doubly linked list, we have to do this for the for loop. We start at the uh, column node immediately to the right of the root, so this uh, R here is a method to get the right node. And then we don't stop until we get back to the root node, and we just keep traversing to the right. So we do this sort of jump, 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 and then we get back to the root node. All the while finding the minimal column, the column with the fewest ones. And here this S thing is a cached value in the column, uh, column nodes for how many ones that uh, the column contains. Right. So to translate this to Perl 6, the immediate translation it's kind of easy. Uh, I bolded the things that I've changed and I marked in red. It might not be very clear, the things that I removed. So in plus 6 we say method, not sub. 
we can remove the declaration of self because every method automatically gets a self. And it's a keyword and not a variable, so we get rid of this dollar here. Uh, I ch changed this method call to having a dash instead of an underscore. Uh, that's just an aesthetic thing. It's possible in Perl 6 and people tend to like it. I didn't change all the underscores of the variables because we'll be getting rid of those. Uh, we have an actual infinity, so we can use that instead of declaring a constant. The strange uh, for loop uh, from C is now called loop instead of for. It can also be used to, to do infinite loops. We don't use string comparison to uh, compare the different column nodes that we encounter. Instead, we use smart matching. Uh, all these dots are instead of arrows. And that's it, I think. Yeah. So basic cosmetic changes. All these things are more or less automatic. You can apply them if you just uh, see a piece of code and think, all oh, right, this is how we do it in Plus 6 and stuff. So it's not big things, just small details. So here's the Plus 6 version. But we still have a problem with this is quite a bit of code and a bit of repetition as well. You have these .r everywhere and .s everywhere. And it feels like you could do better than this, perhaps. And you start thinking about things that people say in the aspect-oriented programming, uh, scattered and tangled. Th those two terms are how your code can be confused in ways that makes it hard to see what's going on. In this case, the code is tangled between green parts which are iterating over a, a, a bunch of columns, and the red part which is, which is collecting the minimum. So we want to do something about that. Unfortunately, that's easy. We just separate these parts. So we end up with slightly more code. Uh, we have a new columns array, which we can push columns to. And then this part again uh, extracts the minimum from that. If you have any problems reading Perl 6 code, let me know. Um, it's tricky when you get accustomed to something, but I think it should be easy to read. Oh, you see, we'll get rid of the parentheses here. So, uh, you may leave them in, of course. It doesn't matter, but it's kind of nice when they're not. Now, the nice thing is that we have a built-in for finding uh, minima of stuff. In Perl 5, you could go to CPAND and use uh, listutil. In Perl 6, we have the uh, dot min method built in. So all we need to do really is take this columns array and find the minimum of it. Now the problem is that the columns array contains objects, not numbers. So we want to find the minimum with respect to something. At which point you do something like sort, you know, um, dollar $A compared to dollar $B. But in plus 6 we have an additional convenience, which is we can pass in a unary function object to minimum and just say uh, compare with respect to this attribute and in this case it's with respect to dot s that we want to compare. So it just ends up being this columns dot min star dot s and this star dot s is uh, sugar for a block and dollar underscore dot s or just dot s. So this is starting to look good, right? We got rid of a bunch of code by realizing that all we did was extract minimum, and min already does that for us, even with some customization of what we want to extract from. We still have this loop up there, and sort of, uh, well, let's get rid of the variable there, because we're just storing something in a variable and then returning it. So let's get rid of that. But we still have this problematic bit up there with it doesn't feel really idiomatic to use a C style for loop there, for example. And it doesn't feel really necessary to do this in two passes, first collecting the columns and then finding the minimum. It seems that we could do better. And it turns out that just as there is a uh, trinary operator as a sort of expression variant of if, there is also an expression variant of for in Perl 6. Anyone heard of the sequence operator? Half dreaded. So I'll take you through this slowly. We have an initiating uh, statement here where we set things up. Here we initiate a variable. We'll get rid of that one as well. Uh, then we have a 
continuing criterion. Uh, how long should we go on? Well, we should go on as long as this is true. And then we have a step, things that we do between iterations. The sequence operator works the same, except we have a value where we start, we have a step in between, and here you see we use this convenient sugar syntax again for saying some things are method. And then we have dot dot dot, and ignore this one for now, and then the place where we want to end. So it's actually reversed from the loop case. In the loop case we say, uh, what is the cr criterion for continuing? And here we say, what is the criterion for stopping? And the semantics of this is that whatever we put here, it gets smart matched against the current value of the sequence. So it actually works out quite nicely. We had a smart match up here, and it was negated. And now we have smart match down here. And since the criterion is different, and it's the opposite in the uh, sequence operator, we uh, get a positive smart match instead. Now the hat assures us that when we find this value, we don't uh, include it in the final sequence. So we actually stop one before. Uh, this is corresponding to the range operators where we can have hats both at the start and the end to say exclude the endpoint. This is exactly the same thinking. So exclude the, the root node here because it's not actually a column node. It just tells us where to start and end. So you see here, we get the correct sequence without doing the loop. We just do a sequence operator and then we take the minimum of now we're, we're talking the sort of right kind of length of a method. And we can do this in Perl 6 because uh, things have coroutines and lazy lists built in. So we're actually not even separating these two in time anymore. We're building this list as we find the minimum. Those two happen sort of temporarily at the same time. And it's quite nice. Uh, you compare the original one to this one, it's definitely less to keep track of and uh, less things that, fewer things that can go wrong somewhere in the, all the bureaucracy and, and boilerplate. Right, thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Otherwise, I could do a live demo with my remaining time. See the demo. Yeah. <laughs> 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 right. So here you see the the directories, the C code, the Perl five code, and the Perl six code, and some documentation. The Perl five code is still the most evolved. You can run, for example. As Sudoku script, which is just a wrapper for, for solving the Sudoku problem. So we set up a reader and a solver, and uh, the writer, which is the final step we actually get from the reader. Uh, it knows how, how to generate the corresponding writer. Uh, and then we just do solve on that. So this one accepts a Sudoku problem from standard input. So we have this one, for example. Right. Perl6, uh, Recruiter recently got lib as a standard path in, in uh, 
Pearl 6 lib, so you don't have to do this one. It's repeating the mistake of Pearl 5. Anything okay. relative to the current directory should never be in a, in a path by default. Oh, interesting. I want to talk to you with you about that later. I was also sort of uh, curious about that addition. I don't think it should stay. Really? No. It's it's not even production default. Ah. Well, at this point, both dot and uh, uh, dot lib dot slash lib is there. Yeah. They're just at different ends of the array. Worse, yeah. Which also seems arbitrary. Have lib as a top level right name component. So this is the syntax I've chosen. And it complains wildly if I don't match these up, which is a feature. <laughs> <laughs> so there's actually a parser sitting and, and uh, uh, figuring out what I mean by these values and translating it into this matrix of series and ones. Let me know if I'm making a mistake here. Also peer review. <laughs> I've received my bu first bug report on this project and it was, the syntax is cumbersome. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of like it though, so I'm, I'm not sure what's the truth. There we go. Yay. Almost instantaneous. <laughs> so that was the Sudoku one. Uh, the Pentominus one. Well, if we run that, that was the 90 minutes one, <laughs> if you remember. On the 9 seconds one. Right. Uh, we'll see. It really takes a lot the terminal longer to print the answer. Sorry? If, if it's got, how many, you seen 60 different solutions? Yeah. Presumably it takes the terminal some amount of time to actually print all the solutions on the screen. Sure. Well, it does that. It just does it slowly. Yeah. You could probably have that running, and, and it will print a, a small number of solutions, but not all of them. That's a good idea, actually. Um, but if you look at this one, yeah, it looks very similar to the Sudoku one, right? Uh, the only difference is the type name of the region. But if you go in and look at, oh, there, there you go, that's the first solution. And that's the syntax I chose for that one. So each of these pentominos has a letter, and you can see, for example, the one that looks like an L also has the letter L. So it fits right there. And the one that looks like a W, kind of shaped like a W, also has a letter mm -hmm. W and so on. So yeah, we'll, we'll let that run, and I'll see if I find now yeah, wrong keyboard. Uh, right, so here's a convenience method called uh, matrix for C. What we can do is, while this is running, we don't need the solver because we're not going to solve it. This goes away. We just do say reader matrix for C. Let's see if this works. Probably need to do that. Oh, yeah. Explore. Five D. Yeah. So this is. Because I didn't have the patience so far to write a parser for C, this is what C accepts. And uh, if you think about this as a 0, 1 matrix, but in instead of writing all the individual zeros and ones, we just write the places where the ones occur. And that's why we have uh, five columns here. And it's a really simple syntax, so we don't care about line breaks. It's that the minus ones here get to represent line breaks. So this is sort of the, whoops. How many rows is that all together? Uh, a couple of thousand. We'll write it to five instead. Um, there we go. Takes almost no time at all. And then we solve it in C. It should be just solved. So which one wins? <laughs> There's been more than 
seconds. Yeah, so probably because I'm, I'm running not only that one. Did you want to uh, redirect to today, maybe? Yeah, probably. Thank you. <laughs> Confused. Shall, shall we time it as well? It might be slightly more than uh, nine seconds because I'm running autonomous in power five in the back one. But there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Seven seconds. Thank you. <laughs>